Because evidently this needs to be said, I do not want you guys to go to today's Target for the purposes of giving them a hard time. Please do not pester these people at all. Thank you. Recording lines while my gums hurt from a root canal. This ought to be fun. So, meet Marley Onama, a reviewer who reviews movies. To put it shortly, she did review a food fight, something I have reviewed three times and I myself consider to be so bad it's good. She got me intrigued with her complaints, so Marley, I hope you don't mind, but I'll be doing my thing by pointing out how you're full of bunk. Let's begin. skit if I've ever seen one. Alright, so let me get this straight. You're doing the evil man wants you to review bad movies review trope, but you only got Windows Movie Maker. Or at least I assume that's what you're using, seeing as your smoke bomb Shogun didn't even have a cloud of smoke to be seen within your intro skit if they kind of just disappear after giving you food fight to review. But wait, you have picture on picture. So in other words, you're just showing you're incompetent with whatever editor you're using, and that's only the tip of the iceberg. For you see, your abhorrent acting skills combined with your wonky line delivery where you have pauses so wide the Grand Canyon looks like a fucking pothole in the road in comparison, your fear and outrage is kinda hard to swallow as you give us no reason to give a fuck. Also, I figure your audience knows your little Shogun friend already, but I certainly don't considering they just show up and disappear never to be seen again within the video. Yeah, spoiler alert, they appear less often than Sunshine does within the movie Marley Hears covering. Oh boy, how long is this video? 17 minutes? Fuck me, it's gonna be one of those, ain't it? Huh, well that's an opening title card. I'll give you one thing, it's short. Beating in. But go look at one of the craziest CG animation you'll ever see. Possibly the worst full-length CG film you will ever see. I'm talking about a movie that has gone through, that has received unbelievably terrible reviews. After, a, after going through years of development hell. Marley, girl, did you script this video because you seem to pause a lot to collect your thoughts, which is increasing the tedium of watching this and may disinterest your audience. Seriously, you got a camera, you got a tripod. Keep a script to it or something, it'll do you a favor. I'm talking about food fight. So this movie's production history is, is very interesting. There was once a studio called Threshold Entertainment, led by Larry Kasanoff, thought it was a good idea to blend Toy Story and Who Framed Roger Rabbit into one CG movie. But the problem was is that he spent all, he had to license a lot of food products to feature their mascots, and that took up a huge budget. The movie was set to be released around Christmas of 2003. Production was going smoothly until the year prior in late 2002, all of the files for the original movie were stolen, reported act of industrial espionage. And they of course had to start all over from scratch. And you think that 10 years in production would actually improve the quality? Wrong! Alright, yes, they did have 10 years to remake this movie, but you know what they didn't have after the espionage? Budget. Within your explanation alone, you should have caught that, given that the movie blew a lot of its budgeting on licensing characters. Not all of which stayed in the movie, showed by your choice to use a trailer that has Chester Cheetah Papa, who doesn't actually appear in the movie. I'm not trying to say this excuses the flaws of the movie, but what I am saying is, without a budget, you can't expect it to be that good. It got terrible! No one really knows what really happened to the files. The movie was gonna star big, big celebrities at the time, like Charlie Sheen, Hilary Duff, Wayne Brady, and Eva Longoria. It's hard to believe that they would all reprise their roles ten years later. 
After all, their budget for the animation was nearly wiped out. So with the little budget they had, production was going at a snail's pace until Larry Kasanoff finally decided, to hell with it! Let's just finish it as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible. Care to show any evidence? Because I can't find anywhere that tells us that this movie was rushed. What I can find was the industrial espionage, marketing controversies, which you interestingly left out, and less than satisfactory responses that the trailer got, all linked below. The only thing that you give us, Marley, is the fact that you think it's rushed, which is quite the buzz phrase reviewers use when a movie just so happens to be shit. And the end result is what I'm going to show you right now. This, per this movie will just make you want to go organic immediately and hate every single processed food brand out there on the market after watching this. What about Lola Frutola, King Tofu, or Charlie Tuna? Those aren't processed foods. Allegedly. I mean, considering Charlie is a tuna brand, King Tofu is, well, tofu, and Lola is a banana brand, those don't sound to me like processed goods to me, but hey, what the fuck do I know? Now let's dive into Food Fight. And so we open up at a supermarket called Market Metropolis Market. Real creative, people. You got What the fuck was that? Was that your screen recording software? Because if so, that flashed the screen, Marley. Try to avoid that in the future because it looks really bad if you don't as it shows us you don't care for quality. I know that's top-notch animation where the street light is clipping right through the car. As the store owner closes up shop, the grocery store comes to life. What, got randiophobia or maybe flatulophobia? Yeah, yeah, I get it. It was a joke or acting, but can't I go off her bad acting without being told, oh, doodle, it's a joke? I see you there in the comments. My golly! Look at this animation! Ten years and this is what we've come to. Computer animated full motion videos on the original PlayStation games look better than this. We then meet the main character, who's not really a food icon, but a detective of the supermarket called Dex Dog Detective. Nice going, Marley. You shot yourself at the foot before the five minute mark. Dex is a cereal brand mascot shown within your footage. I mean, yeah, take it from the gal who watched this movie several times and only noticed it while doing this commentary. If you aren't paying attention, you will miss it. But he's still a brand within universe and saying that he's not when it shows within your footage shows how about well this is going to go. Listen up, fat cat burglar. Wait, fat cat? You mean fat rat? Okay, it's just you and me, fat cat. Now fork over the little guys and no one gets hurt. I'm gonna kill you. Seriously, another mistake. Ten years making this and this movie cannot tell the difference between a rat and a cat. Marley, you did seize the fat cat burglar. He himself is fat and he steals cats. Doesn't matter if he's a rat, he's still a cat burglar, and while this technically is not as important as other things later, the case of the stolen kitten still sets up the scene for the rest of the movie, which thus means these are still important details you're already failing at. Try again. Charlie Sheen must be thinking, oh my god, why did I follow this script? Hey, hairless hamsters, want some of this? Okay, what are these hairless hamsters fighting? Are they fighting the air? They're trying to be intimidating. I mean, yeah, it does look silly. Yes, they are failing at doing so, but there's more of a purpose than you make it out to be. Dude, he's right there, you dummy. So he rescues the kittens in the basket by skydiving out of a, the balloon at a very unrealistic angle. I mean, just look at him. He's just flying straight out of the sky frozen like a fucking statue. Yeah, 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 that's great enough, but they'll never beat Buzz Lightyear. And the kittens don't seem to follow the ba the basket, not even once when he flips in the air and lands. Head a shopper here. This makes 500 consecutive cases you've solved as head of the United Supermarket Defense Association. This isn't a case he solved. This is a rescue mission! Yeah, it very well could have been the case at the beginning, though. I grant you we start at the tail end of the case, but the fact of the matter is they refer to it as a case. To elaborate a bit, because I know some of you love it when I do that, let's go down this path of logic. Perhaps it was the case of the missing kittens. It was a mystery to who had said kittens, and Dex figured out who happened to have had them, being the fat cat burglar. They had their final fight on the balloon, which is where we, the viewers, come in. Come on, Marley, this is elementary logic, and yeah, someone's gonna get on my case with arguing a point with a hypothetical, 
But it's not really a hypothetical considering Food Fight even states that it's a case in the frickin' movie. I mean, Dex Dog Detective is with his best friend, played by Wayne Brady, a chocolate squirrel named Daredevil Dan. What do you think? Whoa, what the? You could four carrots? What did you do, rob the food bank? Yeah, but do you think she'll like it? What if she doesn't like it? Relax, bro. We're talking about sunshine goodness. You could give her a Cracker Jack ring and she'd still say yes. Seriously. Was Wayne Brady cast purely for that joke? Okay, chuck it up to really poor wording or really poor editing on your part, but I'm pretty certain Wayne Brady has nothing to do with Cracker Jacks, or at the very least, I can't find any connection between the two, so I'm pretty sure they could have casted any voice actor for that line. Of a chocolate squirrel who acts in a racially insensitive way? In fact, oh, this movie has more racially insensitive stereotypes than Soul Plane. Regular icons compete against against against. Are you saying what I think Shoes is saying? But I come to fool. I'm innocent. Je suis Francois Fromage. Got it. Voices and accents are all racial stereotypes. No exception. So you're a racial stereotype of American woman, and I'm the racial stereotype of a weeaboo. Hey. If you don't go into why these are stereotypes, hell, Dan doesn't even strike me as such. And even then, why are stereotypes inherently a bad thing? You don't explain that either, you just tell us they're stereotypes and play a few clips that you expect to speak for themselves. He's thinking about proposing to his girlfriend, Sunshine Goodness, played by Hilary Duff. And oh god! What the hell is that? Is that a furry? Well, he's a furry too, but that human's obviously- that's a human girl who's trying to be a furry. That's gross, no! Oh, wow. Hey, I actually do get a chance to play the weeaboo role today. Okay. Not so fast. That's my job. Gon, what are you doing here? Taking back my rightful role as the pin girl. All right. Have at it, then. Kimono Mimi's exist, and literally that's translated to animal ears. The Nico Mimi or cat girl has been around since 1924 when Kinji Miyazawa created the fourth day of Narcissus Moon, which was the story of a girl named Cat. Furries and Nico Minis are two totally different things, and don't you dare let me hear you speak otherwise. Alright, to go off of what Cancer said... No, I I'm not done. The difference between Kimono Mini and furries is how human they are. You putrid American filth known as the furry fandom prefer more animalistic characters being anthropomorphic. Whereas Kimono Minis are still mostly human, just with the ears and on occasion tails of that animal. Learn the difference, you uncultured swine. Okay, now I'm done. Okay. As I was saying, to go off of what Cancer said, there's a lesser case of bestiality going on here than anyone really gives credit for due to the fact Sunshine is still part cat. But that could bring up another question being, why are a cat and a dog having a loving relationship? Yeah, I mean, I guess it kind of sounds racist within the context of the movie, but the fact of the matter is, logically speaking, a cat and a dog would have a natural rivalry. And then again, the dog would also be going after his friend, the squirrel, too, and regret crunching either, as both chocolate and grapes kill canines, so maybe I'm just overthinking it. Whee! However, during the disappearance of Sunshine Goodness, we get a- May I help you? Hold on, is that I am mean? No, I'm fairly certain Mr. Mean became a pretty generic text-to-speech YouTube commentator. This guy looks too out of it to do such a genre. Perhaps it's his retarded cousin? Whee! Out of my club. And he, of course, utters numerous food puns in the movie, and I mean a lot of them. Holy chips. Let's now crack and pop out of here. I'm gonna pop your corn, lady. Let's drop our jam out of here. Crying over spilt milk. And also, there are several sexual innuendo. There are several fetishes going on in this movie. Got milk? Do I look like a dairy queen to you? It warms my heart the way you love my raisins. Oh, but being filthy can be loads of fun. You looking for a guy? About your height? Are those really real? Oh, I'm just panicking. I think I just wet myself. It feels rather nice. Targeted the kids! Why did Larry Cass not think this was a good idea? The reason I played this out as long as I did, because I can touch on both points at once. Considering the food puns that are easily understandable by children and the sexual innuendos that more adult audiences could get, Larry Kasanoff could have been attempting to appeal to all audiences. This really helps my case when you take into consideration this was supposed to come out in 2003, during a time that people were still trying to get away with stuff like that because Animaniacs was so goddamn popular. I grant you, yeah, he did fail monumentally. But considering the script may not have been rewritten, I mean, take it in mind, these things are normally physical, this kind of stuff could have happened. I mean, yeah, it doesn't excuse it, but it might explain the mixed emotions given to their audience. There's a reason why the Nostalgia Critic called this a fetish movie. Arbitrary name drop! Hey guys, am I cool yet? I got my points from Senpai Walker, so I know what I'm talking about, despite the fact that I clearly don't understand when the Nostalgia Critic is making a joke. Actually, 
As far as that goes, I've noticed you may have listed quite a few things from the Nostalgia Critic without realizing what the Nostalgia Critic did right that you're doing wrong. Being the Nostalgia Critic is able to elaborate why things like the sexual innuendos are a problem, whereas you kind of just tell us that they're there. Which, uh, doesn't really work for a review in this style, which is why I stopped doing mine this way. Whee! He wanders the streets for information. Everybody seems to be searching for the- Oh my god! His dick is talking! His bar's sticking out and it's talking to him! <gasps> A glossy R-O-U-S! Ah! No! Don't show me that again! No! 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 Everybody seems to be searching for- Oh my god, his dick's talking! His dick's talking! That's it! Game over, man! Game over! May have a reward for the reckless rodent? Tell me you wouldn't be shocked if they went that direction! Okay, now you're lifting jokes from Doug as well? Well, I think we're hitting a new low for reviewers today. Mark your calendars, people. Yeah, so this guy is Cheezle T. Weasel, and look how glossy his fur is. They don't even have any texture. Speaking of other content creators, there's a reason why JonTron called him a poop rat. Just look at him. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, dude. But this dish is extra spicy. He finds out a secret way by doing this, by talking with... I can't fully identify the main ingredient. Oh, no, nope. this I can tell you. Dr. Sinusex, who is a Jewish stereotype played by James Arnold Taylor of all people. You know, I can make a case for why he's not a Jewish stereotype. Yeah, he's got the nose and the accent, but the fact he's a nasal spray brand Ike, the big nose makes sense. And he is under panic due to Brand X taking over the city. Not to mention, he's not obsessed with money. Hell, the Nazis don't even interrogate him! They actually take out a white bear elephant! Don't you think if they were going for a World War II story with a Jewish stereotype, they'd have the Jewish stereotype be the target of the Nazis? Yes. The guy who actually voiced Ratchet and Clank and Final Fantasy actually had to be part of this piece of shit movie. Go to our market's corporate headquarters, they'd have to recall Brand X. How could you possibly reach them? You couldn't! You get could... Email from Mr. Leonard's computer. But it's in the expiration station, and at the other end of the store, now you'd never make it there before the supermarket opens. You couldn't, you could try. This leads to Dex and Dan crossing the edge of the store by day to enter the database while we meet a bunch of, oh my God, shoppers. What the hell are they rushing for? Is it Black Friday? What is it today, Black Friday? Oh, come on, now we're just getting into borderline plagiarism. Hello, post-production doodle again. I think it's truly a testament to how interesting this commentary has gotten when I have used both a Nostalgia Critic and a JonTron clip. GG. Shut. So, after that, they unrealistically fly on a soda bottle. Please, you expect a movie that has a dog eating raisins and not killing over dead within an hour to be realistic? Please, Marley, you make me giggle. Being chased by a pervert bat with a fetish for chocolate. They make it back to the Copa Banana just before Brand X. Yes, they sing Bl Brand X anthem. Brand X, Brand X, it's simple and plain. Brand X, Brand X, it's different but all the same. And these are the only words, by the way. It's not really a song, it's more of a chant. So it's not a song because it's got a few lyrics? Alright, one, techno exists. Two, that's the point. Three, why is this complaint? And four, fuck you. But however, Dex arrives just in time by playing... The French National Anthem? Why? Well, considering World War II imagery, France was a big part of the Allies, I failed to see an issue, especially since, you know, France played a huge part in World War II, being the people to declare war on Germany in the first place. See? I can give significance to World War II. You're just sitting there being a plug trying to rip up the nostalgia critic. Again. Whee! And after they get into the into a vicious cat fight, it turns out that Sunshine Goodness knocks the ugly right out of her. So Lady X was ugly the whole time. Well, you and world domination. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a spam. Yay! Let's celebrate! Ugly people never win! Alright, this is kind of something that I need to speak up about. It wasn't just she was ugly, you twerp. She was evil. She wanted world domination. That's what she literally got through saying that she wanted. This is something John Tron, the Nostalgia Critic, and in turn, you all got wrong about this movie. 
If it was Ugly Never Wins, which was said in all three videos, then a character like Cheezle T. Weasel, a character that no character within Universe liked, would have survived the war. Sure, we didn't see his ending during the credits, but we know he didn't die within the war. We could also bring up the naked hamsters at the beginning of the movie, who we do see as they were happily dancing despite kicking the crap out of each other. But they show that's to be normal in their world. Point is, there's vital details that tell us that it isn't actually the moral. And because I am pointing this towards the Nostalgia Critic and JonTron, and I know how defensive people in general can be about them, allow me to bring up this counter-argument people tend to give me when it comes to channels like this. It's satire, therefore, don't take it at all seriously. This happened with I Hate Everything, this happened with Game Theory, and odds are it'll happen here even despite me addressing it. Look, while I do see where the argument stems from, yeah, being mostly entertainment means taking them seriously probably isn't your best bet as you'll be taking jokes seriously. But this is like saying that you can never do a commentary on a troll. Ever. If these people make some form of a point to a movie, you can still argue the point and be correct. Sure, it may not look the best on you, but you can still do it. In the case here, they still all made a point to say the moral is ugly doesn't win, and despite whether or not it's a joke, it's technically wrong. Anyway, Marley basically sits here and restates her points again about the movie, and as well as talk about merchandising as if that matters, so I'll just cross the bridge to my final thoughts. Alright, aside from the blatant plagiarism and lifting from other more popular reviewers, wanna know the biggest issue I had with this review? The reason I slacked off as much as I did? Well, simply put, it was a chore to sit through. I had to skip over large parts because nearly half the review was a summarization of Food Fight more than an actual review. This is something that bothers me a lot about reviews and why I don't cover them nearly as much as you'd expect me to. They all do kind of the exact same shtick with barely any variation because that's the style everyone's grown to know. And while I get it, context is important for a review and oftentimes it can be vital to make or break a review. This kind of leads into the second issue. The reason why people who kind of kicked off the style worked, you know, John Tron and Nostalgia Critic, is because they tried to splash in humor while they summarize and give context. And while humor, yes, is subjective, I couldn't tell what was an attempt from here in Marley. I can at least tell with John Tron and the Nostalgia Critic, despite my earlier tangent. Seriously, my advice to you, while isn't a simple one, will very much help you out. Find your own style. Having to rip almost word for word some of the Nostalgia Critic's or John Tron's points and humor shows you don't really have a style of your own. And that on its own is a huge issue because it really helps to stand out in one way or another. It also shows me you don't quite understand what works with the affirmed mentioned reviewers, being that they have their own style of comedy and review. John Tron is much more of a quick-witted smartass who focuses mostly on humor, and the Nostalgia Critic focuses on what makes movies bad but still has the ability for skit-based humor. You seem to have neither of those traits, so you're gonna have to really work with what you got. And this is how I choose to spend my one year anniversary for commentaries. Fucking fantastic. Super Funny Bros, you guys have probably heard of him as he's been around the CC for quite some time and, well, long story short, he hasn't been in my good light due to some of the stuff he's been doing lately. But that aside, he did a video on libertarian socialist rants, aka Kimmy Bams, and also long story short, it was garbage. If you want the long story, the normal links are below, and there's a link to Ski Hound and Dirt Bike Run's commentary on the same video in question. 